which time Fleet Commander Templar expects the first wave of the assault force to have dealt decisive blows against Vasari's forces. I'm sure we all wish our brave men and women good luck and Godspeed. After the lukewarm reception of Killzone, Guerrilla Games took five years before they returned with Killzone 2 in 2009, a game that ended up getting a bit of notoriety with its pre-rendered E3 trailer that was released in 2005. What shocked most people, though myself included, was that when Killzone 2 actually came out, it turns out it was a pretty damn good game, all things considered, and it's still heralded as one of the better shooting games for the PlayStation 3. Finally, for people who owned a PlayStation 3, our mugs could be filled with the salty tears of Xbox fanboys, and was about time. Now, though it did get good reviews from critics and most gamers, I do remember this being one of those titles that people were very vocal about voicing their displeasure over, and there were still a lot of threads on various forums over how bad the game was perceived to be. Was that the case though? Well, let's take a look and find out. So I'm going to assume at this point that if you're watching this video, you've played the first game. But if you haven't, you can expect there to be spoilers from here on in. Okay, so looking back on the events in Killzone 1, Templar and his buddies didn't really accomplish a great deal if you really break it all down. They managed to identify and stop an ISA traitor who was working with the Hellgast, and they pushed back their assault from Vector. But they did little to stop Vasari in the long run, and if anything, it only seemed to motivate the Hellgast army even more as those who were lost during the conflict on Vector were seen as martyrs for the cause. As a result, the war is far from over. And if Killzone 1 was Pearl Harbor, well, then Killzone 2 is the Battle of Berlin, because this time the ISA has brought the fight to Helgen. And if you think these guys are going to take that shit lying down, well, you got another thing coming. This time though, you're playing as a guy named Sevchenko, taking orders from Jan Templar, who's now been promoted to Colonel. Sev now works alongside Alpha Squad, along with Corporal Gaza and Corporal Natko, as well as Rico, who returns from Killzone 1. And they set off on the most dangerous looking dropships I've ever seen. I mean, just look at these things. All they've got is like a railing to stop them from falling over the edge. Do they at least get seatbelts or something? This is fucked up! For some reason now, Rico is a complete loose cannon, and does some stupid impulsive shit that basically changes the entire course of the war, and indirectly causes the death of certain characters. I don't think so. And his actions form major catalysts for the conclusion of the game, which is kinda lazy writing really, considering he's just a walking trope and a pretty dumb side character. Anyway, upon arriving at Hellgan, the original goal is just to capture Vasari and have him charge for his war crimes. But the Hellgast managed to scatter the fleet with some powerful arc cannons and the whole plan just goes to shit. From then it's just a matter of trying to stay alive and bring Vasari to justice. A plan that gets constantly screwed up by the commander of the Hellgast army, a dude named Colonel Raddick, who's basically a comic book villain. The weapon performed adequately. Along the way, Sevchenko and Rico do start to investigate the technology behind the arc cannons, and Raddick kind of takes center stage as the main antagonist for a pretty big chunk of the game. Now, people who bought this game when it first came out are probably going to remember the hoo-ha over the way it looked. I mean, it wasn't as good as that E3 trailer, but it was definitely up there. And I think Killzone 2 is definitely a pretty damn good looking game, especially for its time and considering what it's running on. Some of the areas you visit look really good. Like the bit later in the game where you're on a freight train, for instance, is still impressive. The cinematics are now all in engine, so there's more consistency between each chapter. You don't get this weird jump to a completely different looking compressed cutscene. So overall for the most part, it lived up to the hype. Now though it is a good looking game on the surface, it's achieving that by smoke and mirrors when you really boil it down. There's things like a cheap depth of field effect, there's shader tricks, motion blur, and an overuse on processing effects to cover up things like shoddy and blurry textures, and also kind of mask the draw distance. It's a game that could really do with a HD remaster, because if you wipe away all the grime and the bloom, it's still a very artistic and appealing looking game. Underneath all of that 7th gen console black magic. It's an odd thing too though, because the game looks really good when I'm playing it on my TV and sitting back on my couch, but looking back at captured footage, it looks kind of blurry and even fuzzy at times. Makes up for this though with really good animations almost across the board. Like I'm still a huge fan of the weapon reloading animations in this, which I just think look really cool. The way that Sev pulls out a magazine and then locks it back in just looks genuinely great. And every animation has a sense of weight and purpose and it looks totally believable. When you shoot at the Hellgast, the way they kind of rock and stagger back as bullets rip into them just looks awesome. And the new physics engine which can send them flying like a ragdoll just makes the combat super fun.
even the small things like shooting at someone's head and seeing their helmet fall off. Like, it's a game that still really stands the test of time as this polished and gritty action-packed shooter. A lot of the weapons from before make a return as well, like the M82 Assault Rifle, which now has a more traditional looking reflex sight, and the Hellgast STA-52, which can actually hit what you're aiming at now. The Hellgast light machine gun from the first game returns, though the weapon spread is now absolutely ludicrous. But it's again a pretty effective weapon if you fire in small bursts, because it just does insane damage. There's some new additions too, like an SMG, which looks a lot like the actual PP-19 in real life. And there's a semi-automatic rifle that looks and fires a bit like an M1 Garin that really helps the game stay in line with its World War II influences. If those guns are a bit boring, well, then there's a flamethrower too, which has this really cool looking fire effect. And the added benefit of making enemies dance around when they're lit up, which my inner saddest found highly amusing. I think my favourite though is the Bolter, which is this new weapon that shoots out these large bolts able to impale enemies. And to add a bit of salt into that gaping wound, the bolt then explodes after a couple of seconds, damaging nearby enemies. Sadly though, you don't get to use Rico's machine gun, which is a bit of a bummer. Maybe Guerrilla Games realised how OP that thing was and then they had to remove it. It's kind of crazy too, how there's something like 15 or so different enemy types in the game and they all wield these weapons as well. Oh, at one point you get to hop into a goddamn mech suit and just kick bubblegum and chew ass. I mean, is it ever not fun to hop into a mech suit in first person shooters? The answer to that is no. The first and the most noticeable thing is that the shooting in this one is way more improved. You can aim down sights properly this time and bullets are generally going to go where you're aiming. This is one of the biggest improvements to the game and easily one of the most needed. That obnoxious weapon sway and shaking when you reload guns and perform actions in-game has been massively toned down. I mean, it's still there, but it's far less of a hindrance. So, reloading weapons no longer made me want to throw up, which is a good thing. When enemies throw grenades now, there's a trail of light to make it easier to spot them. Whereas in the first game, if you didn't hear an enemy shout out they'd thrown one, or see it thrown visually, it would often just blow up in your face. Another thing is that the levels now have way more checkpoints. Like in the first game, you could play entire levels without a single checkpoint, taking on dozens of enemies without any kind of save in between. But now these are much more liberal and they're put at places where you would want to see them. You know what I mean? Like after you've completed some kind of intense gunfight or you've entered a new area. Another thing is the music. Yes, Killzone 2 has music during each chapter now and the music is fucking awesome. It has such a huge impact on how the game feels and it makes it feel much more cinematic and emotional, which is what they're really trying to go for. It's more than just generic combat music too, like it changes the mood and tone for each chapter so things always feel different and unique. Yeah. Oh, and now you can jump as well, which is something that was left out of the first game. It's not a huge change because, I mean, you're not going to be bunny hopping around or anything, but the simple addition of the jumping mechanic just makes the movement feel less stifled, and you've got way more control over your character. And yet, the sad part is that despite these improvements, I still think Killzone 2 has taken a few steps backwards. Now, for some reason, you can only hold one primary weapon and a sidearm. In the first game, you could have three weapons, and they could be whatever you wanted. A pistol, shotgun, rocket launcher, whatever you wanted, right? But now it has to be a primary weapon, and the second's always going to be Sev's sidearm, which is a revolver that would make Dirty Harry green with envy. Now, I don't know why they've done this, but it doesn't make it very fun having to swap back and forth between crucial weapons when under fire, like during some of the boss fights, for instance. And I think it also severely handicaps the shooting because you have to pick a primary weapon and then stick with it. If that gun doesn't match your current situation, well, sucks to be you. Another thing is that despite the control scheme being vastly improved, the controls often still kind of feel... How do I say it? I mean, how do I put this eloquently? The controls still feel like dog shit at times. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to put my finger on it, but again, it just kind of feels like there's this input delay. It's something that bothered me all those years ago when I first played it, and it still bothers me now. I think the issue is that it's a game that requires precision shooting, but it doesn't have controls that allow for that. It's like sending someone out to play tennis, but giving them a hockey stick instead of a tennis racket. This isn't really a run and gun shooter, and enemies soak up a lot of gunfire unless you go for headshots. And even then, headshots often aren't an instant kill. I mean, there's even a trophy for shooting the helmet off 100 Helgar soldiers. I've lost count the amount of times that I've shot at someone from long range and seen them fall over and assume them dead, only to then just see them get up a few seconds later and start shooting at me. Most of the guns work best at mid-range, but you're often taking on enemies at long range, and often just not able to find a better weapon for the job. 
Killzone 2 adds in this mechanic of being able to attach to cover by pressing L2, and then you can peek around or over ledges to shoot at the enemy. The thing is, I just never found this to be all that useful, mostly because cover is usually at knee height, and leaning around corners is pointless because you still take damage. I found the default control scheme to be super weird too, like how you press R3 to aim down sights instead of L1 or L2. Now, you can modify it so that L1 aims down sights, but L2 is always crouch and can't be changed. So it becomes kind of weird to try to hold down L2 and press L1 to peek around corners. And don't even get me started on those stupid six axis controls. Look, I don't know what kind of person finds this fun, but all I really want to do is press a single button and be done with it. Oh, I never found the gimmick of physically having to move my controller all that interesting. It's just dumb. And there's a reason this never caught on in game design, because it's fucking stupid. I just imagine that someone who was really high up at Sony came up with this idea, and then some poor schlob had to whack it together to keep his job. I think it also sucks a bit how you can't choose to play as other characters anymore, and the AI that does help you chapter to chapter you're now responsible for. In the sense that if these guys take too much damage, you have to go up and revive them, which is just a pain in the ass. Where the whole thing just starts to go to shit though is about halfway through the campaign, when you start encountering those enemies with missile launchers who are able to one-shot you on normal difficulty. From this point on, the campaign just skates this thin line between feeling challenging and just feeling cheap. The last part of the game is expectedly hard, but it's just this constant gauntlet of Hellgast as you try to make your way to Vasari's palace, and I think it might honestly be the hardest area in any console shooter I think I've ever played. First time I played this, I thought the game was broken or bugged out because enemies just keep coming and coming, but no, it really is this relentless. And I think like the first time I ever played it, it took me like two hours to finish it. I mean, it makes sense from the story point of things because the Hellgast are defending their Emperor to the last, but from a gameplay point of view, it's crushing and not really in a good way. And don't even get me started on the fight against Radic. I won't spoil it, but I'll just say that Radic is basically the embodiment of the nothing personal meme. This guy can teleport behind you and stab you with a knife. He can go invisible and spam grenades. Like, it's just bollocks. As you wish. The greatest tragedy about Killzone 2 is that it never got ported to PC, because if it did and with a mouse and keyboard control scheme, I think it would be one of the best shooting games ever made, and all of these issues would be alleviated. It's got scripted sequences and set pieces that rival anything seen in the Call of Duty games, and the art style and visuals are just incredibly artistic and unique. I think Killzone 2 is definitely one of those instances when how good a game looked made people overlook its shortcomings. But even problems aside, it's still a pretty decent shooting game and one that can still be fun to play. The multiplayer servers were shut down in 2018, but you can play the skirmish mode with bots instead. And it is kinda cool, but it's no substitute for the original multiplayer community. You can also replay the campaign on veteran or elite like some kind of psychopath, but I'd rather stick toothpicks through my nuts than do that. Movie page. I actually knew someone who platinum this game at the time, and after that, he was a changed man, let me tell you. Without spoiling the ending, I'll just say that the Hellgast are still not defeated, and there's still two more games in the series. With Killzone 3, and then the series moving to the PlayStation 4 with Killzone Shadowfall. And we've come this far, so we may as well see things all the way through. So stay tuned, because soon I'll be moving on to Killzone 3, and that's where things start to get really interesting.